Deuteronomy chapter 1, I'll begin by reading the whole chapter. These be the words which Moses spake unto all Israel on this side of Jordan in the wilderness, in the plain over against the Red Sea, between Paran and Tophel and Laban and Hezeroth and Dizahab. There are eleven days' journey from Horeb by way of the Mount Seir and unto Kadesh Barnea. And it came to pass in the fortieth year that in the eleventh month, eleventh month, on the first day of the month, that Moses spake unto the children of Israel according unto all that the Lord had given him in commandment unto them. After he had slain Sihon, the king of the Amorites, which dwelt in Heshbon, and Og, king of Bashan, which dwelt at Ashtoreth in Endrai, on this side Jordan, in the land of Moab, began Moses to declare this law, saying, The Lord our God spake unto us in Horeb, saying, Ye have dwelt long enough in this mount. Turn you and take your journey, and go to the mount of the Amorites, and unto all the places nigh thereunto in the plain, in the hills, and in the vale, and in the south, and by the seaside, to the land of the Canaanites, and unto Lebanon, unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Behold, I have set the land before you. Go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give unto them and to their seed after them. And I spake unto you at that time, saying, I am not able to bear you myself alone. The Lord your God hath multiplied you, and behold, ye are this day as the stars of heaven for multitude. The Lord God of your fathers make you a thousand times so many more as ye are, and bless you as he hath promised you. How can I myself alone bear your cumbrance, and your burden, and your strife? Take you wise men and understanding, and known among your tribes, and I will make them rulers over you. And ye answered me, and said, The thing which thou hast said, what thou hast spoken, is good for us to do. So I took the chief of your tribes, wise men and known, and made them heads over you, captains over thousands, and captains over hundreds, and captains over fifties, and captains over tens, and officers among your tribes. And I charged your judges at that time, saying, Hear the causes between your brethren, and judge righteously, and judge righteously between every man his brother and the stranger that is with him. Ye shall not respect persons in judgment, but ye shall hear the small as well as the great. Ye shall not be afraid of the face of man, for the judgment is God's. And the cause that is too hard for you, bring it unto me, and I will hear it. And I, and I commanded you at that time all the things which ye should do. And when we departed from Horeb, we went through all that great and terrible wilderness, which ye saw by the way of the mountain of the Amorites, as the Lord our God commanded us, and we came to Kadesh Barnea. And I said unto you, Ye are come unto the mountain of the Amorites, which the Lord our God doth give unto us. Behold, the Lord thy God hath set the land before thee. Go up and possess it, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath said unto thee. Fear not, neither be discouraged. And ye came near unto me, every one of you, and said, We will send men before us, and they shall search us out the land, and bring us word again by what way we must go up, and into what cities we shall come. And the saying pleased me well, and I took twelve men, to, men of you, one of a tribe, and they turned and went up into the mountain, and came unto the valley of Eshkol, and searched it out. And they took of the fruits of the land in their hands, and brought it down unto us, and brought us word again, and said, It is a good land which the Lord our God doth give us. Notwithstanding, we would not go up, but rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God, and ye murmured in your tents, and said, Because the Lord hated us, he hath brought us forth out of the land of Egypt, to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites, to destroy us. Whither shall we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our hearts, saying, The people is greater and taller than we. The cities are great and walled up to heaven. And moreover, we have seen the sons of the Anakims are there. 
Then I said unto you, Dread not, neither be afraid of them. The Lord your God which goeth before you, he shall fight for you according to all that he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. And in the wilderness where thou hast seen how that the Lord thy God bare thee as a man doth bear his son, in all the way that ye went until ye came into this place. Yet in this thing ye did not believe the Lord your God, who went in the way before you to search you out a place to pitch your tents in, in fire by night to show you by what way ye should go, and in a cloud by day. And the Lord heard the voice of your words, and was wroth, and sware, saying, Surely there shall not one of these men of this evil generation see that good land, which I swear to give unto your fathers, save Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, he shall see it. And to him will I give the land that he hath trodden upon, and to his children, because he hath wholly followed the Lord. Also the Lord was angry with me for your sake, saying, Thou also shalt not go in thither. But Joshua, the son of Nun, which standeth before thee, he shall go in thither. Encourage him, for he shall cause Israel to inherit it. Moreover, your little ones, which he said, should be a prey, and your children, which in that day had no knowledge between good and evil, they shall go in thither, and unto them will I give it, and they shall possess it. But as for you, turn you, and take your journey into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. Then ye answered and said unto me, We have sinned against the Lord, and will go up and fight according to all that the Lord our God commanded us. And when ye had girded on every man his weapon of war, ye were ready to go up into the hill. And the Lord said unto me, Say unto them, Go not up, neither fight, for I am not among you, lest ye be smitten before your enemies. So I spake unto you, and ye would not hear, but rebelled against the commandment of the Lord, and went presumptuously unto, up into the hill. And the Amorites which dwelt in that mountain came out against you, and chased you as bees do, and destroyed you in Seir, even unto Horma. And you returned and wept before the Lord, but the Lord would not hearken to your voice, nor give ear unto you. So ye abode in Kadesh many days, according unto the days that ye abode there. Now here in Deuteronomy, they often call this the second law. So what you're going to find with this book, and I, I really like it, is it's a condensed version of everything basically you found in between. And you're going to find God often reiterating the things that he taught previous in this chapter. You'll see the repetition of the Ten Commandments, for example, coming up in a little ways. You'll also see many of the stories and, and the uh, tales that happened before come back to pass as God iterates them. Now, the time frame that we're looking at, and you can go, keep your finger in Deuteronomy chapter 1. And the time that Deuteronomy was spaken, the Bible says, go to Numbers chapter 12 is in Numbers chapter 12 and beginning in verse 30, sorry, Numbers chapter 12 and verse 3. I'm all over the place here. 11 and verse 35, and it says, And the people journeyed from kiroth Hatha unto Hezeroth and abode at Hezeroth. Now regarding the spiritual state of Israel at this case, look no further than Numbers chapter 12 and verse 4, where it says, And the Lord spake suddenly unto Moses, and unto Aaron, and unto Miriam, Come out ye three unto the tabernacle of the congregation, and they three came out. And the Lord came out in a pillar of the cloud, and stood in the door of the tabernacle, and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forth. And he said, Hear now my words, if there be a prophet among you, I the Lord will make myself known unto him in a vision, and will speak unto him in a dream. Why is he reminding of the status of a prophet? Is because right before that, he said very clearly in verse 1, Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses. So the spiritual state of these is that even the leadership at this time was in a, a state of speaking against their leader, Moses. Speaking against the prophet. Many uh, times before, actually, Israel had said, Moses, you speak to God. We don't want to hear his voice when the fire fell on the mountain. And yet here we find them speaking against Moses and continuing on. And their, their arguments and their, their issue with him 
is that he had married then an Egyptian woman. And so we find people in a spiritual state where they're in rebellion against God's leader. They're in rebellion against the Lord himself. And they're constantly bringing upon themselves the fire of the Lord and the anger of the Lord. And it's just this cycle of rebellion and making God angry and rebelling and making God angry and rebelling and making God angry. Now, in Deuteronomy in verse 2, it says this state. It says, There are eleven days journey from Horeb by the way of the mount unto Seir, or the way of the mount Seir unto Kadesh Barnea. And why does it make that statement? Well, you can go and you can check this out later, but the position from Mount Seir unto Kadesh Barnea encompasses two basic stories. The first being that of Exodus chapter 17. Exodus chapter 17. Where you have what's referred to as the waters of Meribah. In Exodus chapter 17, in the second part of verse 1, it says um, that, And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord, and pitched in Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. And so if you continue on, it says, Wherefore the people did chide with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide ye with me? Wherefore do ye tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water, and the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? Go down to verse 6, it says, Behold, Moses speaking now, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, and the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the chiding of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us? or not. And so this was one of the beginning statements made in the journeyings of Israel. They had just gotten out of Egypt and immediately they come to a place where there's no water and they ask the statement, is God even among us? Is God even with us? Is God just bringing us out here to kill us? They're chiding against the Lord and specifically murmuring and chiding against Moses, their chosen leader at that time. This is known as the waters of Meribah and other places of scripture. Numbers chapter 13, Numbers chapter 13, we find this story in Numbers chapter 13, beginning in verse 21, the Bible says, So they went up and searched the land from the wilderness of Zin unto Rahab, as men come unto Hamath. Verse 23 says, And they came unto the brook of Eshcol, and cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes, and they bare it between two upon a staff. And they brought of the pomegranates and of the figs. The place was called the brook of Eshcol because of the cluster of grapes which the children of Israel cut down from thence. And they returned from searching of the land after forty days. Verse 26 reads, And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Look down in verse 30, And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. In verse 31, But the men that went up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And so, if you go back to Deuteronomy, that little statement there in verse 2, verse two 11 days journey from Horeb, by the way of Mount Seir unto Kadesh Barnea encompasses the whole of time there from Exodus chapter 7 unto Numbers chapter 13, which should have been 11 days journey. And yet we find much more time taking place because verse 3 kicks right off and it says, and it came to pass in the 40th year. Now, as soon as they walked over into, from Egypt, crossing the Red Sea, 
Time started, right there in Exodus chapter 1. This shall be the beginning of months unto you. Here we find 40 years later, they're at a place what should have taken them but 11 days, maybe the few days before leading up to that event at Horeb. They went from the waters of Meribah, chiding because there was no water, to the evil report at Kadesh where they could not enter into the land for their unbelief. Now why did this whole journey take 40 years? The Bible records that in that time, nothing more than murmuring, complaining, doubting, and rebellion, and lust against God and against His ways. Now these are the same reasons that we find today that God's plans for us are delayed. God would have taken us on an 11 day journey and let yet 40 years later we find ourselves brought to that same position of making a decision in his favor. The same reasons why you'll find yourself, you know, walking around in the wilderness coming to the same decision time and time again is the same reason why Israel found themselves in this predicament for their murmuring, their complaining, their doubting, their rebellion and their lust. They spake all against this commandment, and the commandment was made very clearly by God. Look at verse 3. It says, In the eleventh month, in the first day of the month, that Moses spake unto the children of Israel, according to all that the Lord had given him in commandment unto them. Verse 4, it says, And after he had slain Sihon, king of the Amorites, which dwelt in Heshbon, and Og, king of Bashan, which dwelt at Ashtaroth and in Drei. Now that timestamp there is Numbers chapter 21, so we can find that the spiritual state is given. The amount of time it took to get to this place is given. Immediately after Sihon is killed and Og king of Bashan is killed in Numbers chapter 21, Moses begins to expound unto them all of the commandments that were given unto him in the law. And here it begins and says that Moses starts to declare this very law in verse 5. On this side of Jordan in the land of Moab began Moses to declare this law saying. Now the law isn't just da 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 different commandments that are given in order. Though we see that in some places. He starts to explain the law as a history of stories. And it's wonderful that God gives us his commands quite often in a history of stories of real people and real events. So that when we learn from him it's actually very exciting to read about what's going on. It's actually very exciting to pull out truths from the scripture as God leads us in these things. And here Moses, it says in verse 2, he says, Of this law, the Lord our God spake unto us in Horeb, saying, Ye have dwelt long enough in this mount. And so the journey started. And what should have been 11 days later, they find themselves 40 years in this predicament. Long enough in this mount, he says, now it's time to get out and get into this wilderness. Look at verse 7. Turn you and take your journeys, and go to the mount of the Amorites, and to all the places nigh thereto, in the plain, in the hills, and in the vale, and in the south, by the seaside, to the land of the Canaanites, and unto Lebanon, unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Behold, I have set the land before you. Go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give unto them and to their seed after. Now we all know of the seed promises, and I'll just refer to a few of them in brief. But if you could, you could go back to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12 where God begins to expound unto them the different promises through one man, Abraham. And that's what started the whole of the nation of Israel receiving of the same. Genesis chapter 12, beginning in verse 1, the Bible says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I shall show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curses thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be Bless. Specifically, now he's talking of Abraham. I will bless thee, singular, and curse those that curse thee, singular, and in thee shall all of the families of the earth be blessed. Now, how does that play out? Look over in verse 6, and it says, And Abram passed through the land unto the place of Sychem, unto the plain of Morah, and the Canaanite was then in the land. 
And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. So there's the first time you find the land promised unto the seed of Abraham. Now you can double check whenever the seed's referred to. It gives you that as Abraham's, yes, um, uh, generations after him out of um, his wife Sarah and it continues on as the seed of Abraham but also that seed is Christ the Bible will eventually confirm that any land any inheritance any promise that's made comes by way of Christ we'll also find as we study this out that this land promise that's being made where he says I'll give you this land is always going to be conditional of own if or a but statement that basically says that if you, then I will. If you, then I will continually. But if you don't, then I will not uphold that side of my promise. God is very clear on that. Now you can go over to chapter 13 and verse 6. And the Bible says, And the land was not able to bear them that they might dwell together, for their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. And that's when you start to see, essentially, them spreading out because the land just gets so overwhelmed with the amount of generations that Abram is creating, but not only that, his, his, uh, his uh, nephew Lot. In 15 verse 5, it continues to explain, chapter 15 verse 5, And he brought him forth in a boat and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it unto him for righteousness. And so, if you could go back to Deuteronomy, we're going to pick it up. In verse 11, we've read um, that the stars of heaven for multitude are what Abram's seed was, what Israel was at this case. Therefore, that promise being fulfilled. A seed multiplied and a land available to that seed. Look at verse 11. And the Lord God of your fathers make you a thousand times and many more as you are and bless you as he hath promised. And blessed indeed, though they're a carnal group, though they're a rebellious group, they indeed have, have received of the blessings of God and the care of God up to this time. And the writer here, Moses, says, Would to God he would bless you abundantly so. We can see there the mercy of God and, and the mercy of, of the leader Moses of God as he says, you know what, you're a rebellious group, but, but would to God that as a thousand times more as you are, you would be blessed and you would be receiving of the promises of the same. Verse 12 continues, How can I myself alone bear your cumbrance and your burden and your strife? So as you continue, because he could not bear the people Israel at this time and of himself, he took a righteous um, opinion and a righteous judgment from his father-in-law Jethro, and he said and did what says in verse 13, Take you wise men, and understanding, and known among your tribes, and I will make them rulers over you. And he answered me and said, The thing that which thou hast spoken is good for us to do. So I took the chief of your tribes, wise men and known, and made them heads over you, captains over thousands, and captains over hundreds, and captains over fifties, and captains over ten, and officers among your tribes. And so here, Moses wants them to be blessed. He wants them to succeed. And so he says, I can't take this cumbrance of myself. I'm going to give you what you need. And what you need is leadership over you. And he starts to set over each individual group wise men that are capable for the task ahead of them. Set rulers. Set judges. And what would their duties be? Look in verse 16. And I charged your judges at that time, saying, Hear the causes between your brethren. And judge righteously between every man and his brother and the stranger that is with him. So a good leader hears the causes and he judges righteously. Verse 17 says, Ye shall not respect persons in judgment, but ye shall hear the small as well as the great. Ye shall not be afraid of the faces of man, for judgment is God's. And so... When you hear as a leader, when you judge righteously as a leader, two things that you need to watch out for is that you do not have respect of persons. You do not take the person of somebody, in other words, their status, their position, their relation to you, their age, different circumstances about them, and give them more preference to another. 
You shouldn't take the wealthy and judge a certain way compared to how you would judge the poor. But rather, you should always eliminate respective persons from your judgment. And the next thing that you need to recognize when you're making judgment calls is that you need to do them apart from the fear of man. You shall not be afraid of the face of man, for the judgment is of God. People always say to you, judge not, judge not. If you're judging according to the word of God, then you have no need to fear the faces of those that are disputing the judgments that are being made. Ultimately, God is the judge, and these are what the leaders were to do when Moses established them. They were to take the word of God, hear the causes, and judge according to the scriptures and according to what God's final judgment would be. Because the judgments of God's is God's, you're not judging according to the appearance, but you're judging righteous judgment. How do we judge righteous judgment all the time, every time? We use the book all the time, every time continues on in verse 17, it says, And the cause that is too hard for you, bring it unto me and I will hear that. So even if you're brought to a position where you need to make a judgment, it's okay to ask somebody who is perhaps a little more skillful than you, a little more wise than you, somebody that, that knows the situation a little bit better, or a little bit differently. So he says, hey, if you can't handle all the causes, it's too hard, bring it unto me. In verse 18, And I commanded you at that time all the things which ye should do. And how did he do that again? He did it through the scriptures. These are all the things that ye should do. And they were to follow those in their judgments. Now, the command is made in verse 19, to go and to conquer. Verse 19, And when we departed from Horeb, we went through all the great and terrible wilderness, which he saw by the way of the mountain of the Amorites, as the Lord our God commanded us, and we came to Kadesh Barnea. And I said unto you, ye are come unto the mountain of the Amorites, which the Lord our God doth give us. Behold, the Lord thy God hath set the land before thee. Go up and possess it, as the Lord God of your fathers hath said unto thee. Fear not, neither be discouraged. And isn't that the same truth with regard to um, conquering in the Christian life as it is with regard to salvation to become a Christian in the first place? As the Bible says, the Lord thy God hath set the land before thee. And I often use that illustration. If I take a gift and I set it before thee, if I just set it on your doorstep, it doesn't do you any good until you do what? You take of that gift. God hands us spiritual victory over so many problems in our life. He will literally give it to us. But how do we get it? Go up and possess it. Go to that gift and possess it. When God gives you somebody that is, is ready to be saved in your life, you need to go up and possess that. When God gives you um, an opportunity to overcome an addiction and overcome a fear, overcome a problem, a sin in your life. You need to basically just recognize that God has given this land before you. You need to go up and possess that thing. You need to do it without fear. And this was the problem that Israel had was that they were always in fear. They were driven by fear. And today we have so many people that are driven by fear. And I've been guilty of it throughout these last few weeks, finding myself in moments in my life throughout the day where I start to be driven by fear. Literally, my heart starts pounding for some of the things that are going on in this world. But we can't be driven that way. Hey, God has given us the victory. He's promised us the victory over sin, over Satan, over self. All we have to do is go up and possess it without fear. Fear not, neither be discouraged. Two things that will ruin the Christian life is fear and becoming discouraged in our Christian walk. Be resolved to face challenges in our lives the same way as Moses commanded Israel to face challenges in their life. Fear not, neither be discouraged. Just go and possess the victory. Go and take the victory God has given to you. Verse 22, it says, And ye came near unto me, every one of you, and said, we will send men before us, and they shall search out the land, and bring us word again by what way we must bring us word again by what way may we must go up, and into what cities we shall come. And it continues and says, And the saying pleased me well, and I took twelve men of you, one of a tribe. Now, when I read this, it, it's it's confusing to me because he says, Go up and possess it, and he says, Fear not, neither be discouraged. And the first thing that the children of Israel want to do is come up with their own plan for how they're going to do this, okay? Planning isn't necessarily a bad thing, but I just, I feel that doubt is all over this situation. 
Because God says, go up and possess it. The leader Moses says, fear not, neither be discouraged. And they said, we'll send spies so we can try to figure out the best way to get in there. It almost sounds like when God promised the land, he promised every spot that the sole of your foot touched would be yours. In other words, you're going for a Sunday stroll into a foreign land, and everywhere you go, you're getting more of it. Just one step at a time, one step at a time, one step at a time. That doesn't sound like something that you need to go in and spy out and search out and try to find out what is the best city to go and which way we must go and all of these sort of planning things. It sounds to me like the first thing that they, they did, though it did seem well unto Moses, he rationalized and said, okay, that seems to make sense. I believe that was the first step of doubt. Instead of just accepting and believing and taking the promise as it was advertised, to just go in and possess it. Go up and possess it. Don't fear, neither be discouraged. They almost doubted that they could take it, so they were going to go and spy this thing out first to figure out whether those things were so. It's almost like a yea hath God said in a moment. I don't know if Saint was there actually whispering into somebody's ears trying to get them to, to uh, doubt, but they definitely doubted the word of God and behaved as such. Now, if you look in verse 24, it says, And they turned and went up into the mountain and came into the valley of Eshkol and searched it out. And they took of the fruit of the land in their hands and brought it down unto us and brought us word again and said, It is a good land which the Lord our God doth give us. And so they confirmed it in one aspect, but they also failed in another aspect. Because they didn't have the faith to just go up and take it. They confirmed that God's promise was good, that the land is suitable. The land is a blessed land. The land is yielding wonderful fruits. Milk and honey is flowing from We confirmed that. But in the same token, they doubted God. And they didn't confirm that God was able to give it to them as it was promised. It is a good land which the Lord doth give us. But verse 26 indicates that they did not take it. They did not actually believe in God's promise to give it unto them. Rebellion sets in, verse 26, Notwithstanding, ye would not go up, but rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God. And ye murmured in your tents and said, Because the Lord hated us, he hath brought us forth out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Their rebellion did not accept the promise of God. And then we find out that not only did they doubt and rebel against his command, but then they started to murmur in our tents, in their tents. And that's where things really get bad. Because their murmuring led to more rebellion, which led to what? Irrational imaginations. They literally started believing Though they had just walked into a land and saw the great blessing that it entailed. They had heard the promise of God that they just have to go and take it. They looked at the situation and said, we can't take that. We can't overcome them. Not only that, God just brought us out here to kill us. See how their minds just ran with them because their murmuring in their tents led to more rebellion, led to more irrational imaginations. And this is the problem that we all get into when we go home into our tents and start murmuring about the promises of God. Start questioning about the promises of God. Start doubting what's going on in the will and the world that God has us in. In our circle, in our church, among our leaders, among our believers, our fellow congregation, among this, this body here. When we start to doubt what God has clearly promised us and clearly offered up to us if we would just take it, we go back and we start to doubt, we start to murmur. Next thing we know, we're just like, man... Brother Josh is leading us off a cliff. Man, God just wants to bring us out and kill us. Man, so-and-so looked at me funny. I bet you she hates my guts. Man, this and that and this and that. And th Next thing you know, you're just your imaginations have taken you someplace that's so far from reality. And you got there because first you rebelled against the commandment. Then you murmured. And it all came from the point where you didn't believe God's promise enough to just go and take it. Verse 28, it says, Whither shall we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our heart. And it's amazing what discouragement can do, especially when it comes from somebody that's brethren. Somebody that should be lifting you up, encouraging your heart. That's what we're here for as a church, to encourage one another. Discouragement weighs people down so much, and it's contagious. To where these are saying, God's trying to kill us, 
and the people is greater and taller than we. The cities are great and walled up to the heaven. Moreover, we have seen the sons of the Anakim are there. Everything's stacked against us. The people are stacked higher than us. The cities are stacked higher than us. And everybody starts to think about the challenges of this life being so huge, and they forget just how big their God is and sufficient to take control of these situations. He promised these lands will be yours. These people will be conquered. There is nothing you need to fear. Don't be discouraged. And yet here they are immediately after failing the promises because they doubted enough to go and search these things out that now they are discouraged. They are doubting. They are rebelling. They are murmuring. They think God's after them. And no good is going to come of this situation. But Moses, as he often does, and we need more people like Moses in this church and in our lives. He begins to encourage. He says, dread not, neither be afraid of them, in verse 29. Dread not, neither be afraid of them. The Lord your God, which goeth before you, he shall fight for you, according to all that he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. Moses comes and he encourages them. But it's not sufficient for the murmuring that's overtaken them. And again, you see the power. This is why we need to all just get on board with the encouragement program, one with another, because a little bit of discouragement will take down the whole lump of us, the whole lot of us, because we'll all succumb to that fear and to that dread, as the Bible here is clearly showing. Moses is encouraging them. He's telling them the truths of the Scripture, and yet it says, and in the wilderness, verse 31, where thou hast seen how the Lord thy God bare thee as a man doth bear his son, in all the way that you went until you came into this place, Yet in this thing you did not believe the Lord your God, who went in the way before you to search you out a place to pitch your tents. God was the one that searched out the place to pitch their tents in fire by night, to search you by what way ye should go, and in the cloud by day. God's leading, God's searching. God knows what was in that promised land. Why did they need to go and search it out for themselves, tempting themselves in that thing? Verse 34, And the Lord heard the voice of your words, and was wroth, and sware, saying, Surely there shall not one of these men of this evil generation see that good land, which I swear to give unto your fathers. Save Caleb the son of Jephunneh, he shall see it. And to him will I give the land that he hath trodden upon, and to his children. Why? Because he hath holy Followed the Lord. Also, the Lord was angry with me for your sake, saying, Thou also shall not go in thither. But Joshua, the son of Nun, which standeth before thee, he shall go in thither. Encourage him, for he shall cause Israel to inherit it. Moreover, your little ones, which ye said should be a prey, and your children, which in that day had no knowledge between good and evil, they shall go in thither, and unto them will I give it, and they shall possess it. This is revealing that a whole generation of doubters fell because they were given to discouragement. They were given to murmuring and the imaginations of their evil hearts. They rebelled against God when all they had to do was reach out and take what God had promised unto them. And as a church, I don't want to be a part of the number or a part of the fold that doubts and then gets destroyed. So that the only thing left is a remnant of what things could be, and the only thing that's left is to the few that believed and to little ones that didn't even know any better when these decisions were made. The faithful and the feeble, they received the promise and they were set to receive the promise. What happens to the rest? Verse 40. But as for you, turn you and take your journey into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. They were to continue in that wandering, in that wilderness, in that wasteland. It's not the good place for the Christian to be. It's not the promised land. It's not the land flowing with milk and honey. When you're caught up just wandering about, aimless need, no purpose, no plan, no God directing you, no God leading you, simply just walking in circles, wandering about. We need to be unto the victorious path. We need to be as Joshua and Caleb, who are faithful to holy follow God, and stand in where we need to stand, and receive of the inheritance as we ought to receive it. Even here, they're given the promise that they would go and lead about the little ones who, it wasn't their fault that their parents had made these wrong decisions. But as for those parents, turn you and take you to your journeys in the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. 
Then ye answered, and here's that too little, too late moment. And this is what we often do. God brings us to a crossroad. He brings us to a door of opportunity. He brings us to a decision, and we should choose to wholly follow Him, and instead we choose some other way, our own way, our own path, our own direction. We follow after the ways of the world, and then God says, fine, it's closed off. Go wander out in the wilderness a little bit longer, and then we're like, no, 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 wait, never mind. That's not what I want. I'll follow you now, God. And here, the people of Israel answered and said unto me, We have sinned against the Lord. We will go up and fight according to all that the Lord our God commanded us. And when ye had girded on every man his weapon of war, ye were ready to go up into the hill. Now I believe God is faithful to forgive them in their sin as they ask for forgiveness, but that doesn't necessarily mean that God is going to get them right back on track with the plans that he had for them. God will forgive us our sins, but he doesn't necessarily still open back up those doors of opportunity. It's just like when the opportunity came to me to come and join up with this church and start laboring here. I felt like that door opened up, and I honestly in that moment felt it was closing at the exact same time. There was a little space of grace, a little window of opportunity, a door to walk through. And had I not walked through it, a whole world of wilderness was out there waiting for me. Who knows where I would have been? Who knows where these in this, in this room would have been? But God opened up a door and I chose to walk through it. I wholly followed the Lord in that case. I'm not perfect, of course. But because I did, here we are. I believe that with all my heart. When God calls, answer. When He opens doors, walk through. When He commands, obey. Just simply obey. Just simply do what He wants. Don't rebel. Don't be discouraged. Don't fear. Take what God asks of you. Take what God promises of you. And just go after it. Seek it. Find it. Go up and possess it. The Lord said unto me in verse 22, Say unto them, Go not up, neither fight, for I am not among you, lest ye be swinton before your enemies. So I spake unto you, and ye would not hear, but rebelled against the commandment of the Lord, and went up presumptuously unto the hill. And the Amorites which dwelt in the mountain came out against you and chased you as bees do and destroyed you in Seir even unto Hormah. And ye returned and wept before the Lord, but the Lord would not hearken unto your voice nor give ear unto you. So ye abode in Kadesh many days according to the days that ye abode there. So what's the moral of their story here? The moral of their story is they should have the first time when God promised setting before them a land, they should have just went up and possessed it. No fear. No discouragement, simply take the good land that God had given unto them. But because Israel chose to rebel and murmur and let their imaginations run, thinking God's trying to destroy them, thinking Moses is a fool for leading them that way, not even believing the encouragements of Moses as he said, dread not, neither be afraid. There's still time to make the right decision. They rebelled against him. They said, we will not go up. And so God drew a hard line that day in the sand. He said, the faithful that are following me, they will continue into this promised land. They will be blessed by all the promises. The rest of you will walk about in waste. Now, they asked for forgiveness, and I believe God forgave them. And if you look in verse 46, it says, So ye abode in Kadesh many days. Meaning God still took those and provided for them a long life. You gotta think 40 more years to wander the wilderness. That means, well, they didn't have the milk and honey. They didn't have the promised land. God still cared for them as they wandered about the wilderness, leading them in a pillar of smoke and in a pillar of fire, providing for them all they needed to survive miraculously in a wasteland. He provided all that for them, but it wasn't the best plan for them. It wasn't the good plan that God had for them. It wasn't the good land that God wanted them to have, but they made their decision, and once that decision was made, they could never do anything to fix it. The same is true in our lives. God has a perfect will for you, and he's going to bring you to that one crossroad decision at a time. One yes Lord or no Lord at a time. One decision to trust and obey or to pull back, draw back, and forsake at a time. And we'll be brought to each of those according to God's perfect will and God's perfect timing for these things. And I would just encourage you to hear the word of God as it's spoken, to 
engage in the Bible, to listen to the Bible as it's speaking to you. And when you come to a decision and you're overwhelmed with fear, know that fear is not of God. God doesn't give us the spirit of fear. And so if you're fearful of jumping into this pool, then that probably means that it's the pool you ought to jump into, if you know what I mean. Because fear is not a driving factor in God's economy, God's world for us. So what happened to these it was too little too late. They chose to still proceed. And what did God do? So say my, my decision was to come and to, and, to, and to take over and lead this church. If I chose not to at that time, that door closed. And then I'm like a month later, you know what? Never mind. I'm going to do it. Suddenly things are going to be harder for me. What happens here? God's not with them. You didn't hear. You rebelled. You went presumptuously. You tried to go some other way to my will for you. Ultimately, to these people, God had the enemies of the Lord destroy them, beat them down, leave them weeping and wailing. God, I thought this was my will for, or your will for me. I thought you wanted me to go and to, and to lead about this church. I thought this is what you wanted for me. Here, these, they're like, Lord, Lord, I thought you wanted to give me this good land, this promised land. We're trying to take it. And he says it's presumptuously. You presume that I was still with you. You presume that you were still in my will and I was going to go about and bless you. But that road, that ship has sailed. That day is past. It's too late now. And so they returned and wept. But in this manner, in this area, God would not hearken, neither give ear unto them. He still provided for them 40 years, miraculously caring for them in the desert. But the time and the opportunity to get God's best, to get the good land that he had given them, it had closed. And so look out for these opportunities. And God won't just spring it on you. And you won't just have any clue. It'll be just like, door number one, door number two, go. And you just have no idea. No, God brings you in your life, as he did with them. An 11 year or 11 day journey that took 40 years where he was saying, promised land, promised land, promised land, promised land, promised land. And then he says, here it is. And they said, nope. They knew that that decision was coming. And in your life, you're going to know when those decisions are coming. As I knew the decision, I was already praying about getting involved in a church in this capacity. I was already praying about having more involvement in the ministry. Praying about the call to preach. I already wanted that for me. For myself, and I, and I knew God was leading me in that fashion. So when the decision came, I took a few moments, but I knew what decision I had to make. And this is what God's going to do with you. He's going to tell you, promised land, promised land, promised land, promised land. I'm going to lay before you a promised land. I'm going to set this before you. Fear not. Don't be discouraged. I'm going to give this to you, and then the day will come, and you'll know it. When God will set it before you, and you just have to reach out and take it. Reach out and take it. Trust and obey. Reach out and take it. And when you do... God will be with you in that whole thing. And you'll be as Caleb. You'll be as Joshua. You'll simply walk into a blessing, inherit a blessing. But unfortunately for those two, they were faithful. They followed after God. They didn't get those 40 years. They missed out on those 40 years in the promised land because of the other people in the congregation that dwelt them down. And so this is another thing we need to recognize. We're all not an island to ourselves. We need to walk in faith as a group, as an entire church, all together. Because if the majority gets discouraged by one murmur, the majority gets frustrated by one person that is distracted, by one person that is, that is hurting, by one person that is letting their imaginations run wild and they're rebelling, and everybody starts to catch that bug and that thing gets contagious and starts to drag us down, then even those that are faithful in this thing, even those that are faithful will ultimately suffer the consequences. So this is why it's important. We need to keep an eye on these things, encourage one another, lift up one another, like we did today in prayer. If somebody is hurting in an area, hey, you know what? I'm really having trouble forgiving Jamie because he, he stepped on the heel of my shoe and my foot slipped out. I'm really having trouble forgiving him, and, and this is going to be a problem. Then I can bring that to somebody, and we can pray together, and I can forgive it. I can let it go. And suddenly, what could have been a root of bitterness springing up onto murmuring and disputes and fighting in the congregation, we just let go of it and we move on and we're growing because of it. This is why it's important as a congregation that we get discouragement out, get fear out, and we just are ready to take the promises that God's given us. And I believe that we are standing in part of what God has promised to give us. This building, this congregation, this group of believers, this city... God's promised us that we can make a big impact here. 
We just need to reach out and take it. One decision, one challenge, one yay or nay, one yes, Lord, at a time. Just simply trust and obey and trust and obey and walk with him. Follow after him. Holy follow the Lord and delight in his way. And he will definitely take care of us and fulfill his promises to us. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father, for this day.